Good morning, everybody. Welcome into the Farzy Show. My name is Mark Farzetta here at the Steven Singer Studios. We got the Flyers losing again, unfortunately. Joel Embiid, Eastern Conference Player of the Month for the month of December. And uh, we also have Jalen Hurts. More reason to love this guy as to why he should be the franchise quarterback of the Philadelphia Eagles. Now, uh, that's still up for much debate. We're going to be discussing that on this show today with our guest, Ruben Frank from NBC Sports Philadelphia. Good friend of mine, and really nobody covers the Eagles better than Ruben Frank over the last near 40 years of Eagles football. So we'll talk to him. Uh, Ruben's got a great article, if you haven't seen it already. Ten observations by Ruben Frank. It's a must-read every single week. But this particular read is astounding because there's two statistics that just blow your mind. One is the Eagles' all-time rushing record that I didn't even realize was so old. For the most touchdowns they've scored in a season, rushing touchdowns they've scored in a season, they're about to break a 76-year-old record when it comes to rushing touchdowns in a season with 25. That is amazing. I never thought a modern NFL team would break a record that old in the way that the game is played today. But this Eagles team is just about to do that. Also, Jalen Hurts' improvement we'll be discussing from last year to this year because Jalen Hurts joins a list of only now three, three quarterbacks in the NFL to improve completion percentage-wise from rookie season till second season, the best ever. Three quarterbacks have done what Jalen Hurts has done so far this season, and it looks like that'll be it for Jalen Hurts. He most likely will not play on Saturday. So we'll dissect all this on the show today, but we will start it off with the mindset and the person that Jalen Hurts is. If you haven't seen it already, here's the letter. I'll spare, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but we all saw the video of the guardrail crashing down at Jalen Hurts' feet with fans falling over him left and right. They get up, he puts his arms around him like, who wants a selfie? We've joked about it throughout the week already, but Jalen Hurts wrote this letter to the Washington football team, as well as to league officials to help prevent that type of accident from ever happening again. So Jalen Hurts right now is trying to help the Washington football team, Dan Snyder, run his organization. If they can't do it, somebody else is, and that person's name is Jalen Hurts. If you cannot find it in your heart to root for this guy, to be the franchise quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles, like the mindset, the, the, the type of guy that he is, his personality, the, the work ethic, his kindness now and all that. If you can't find it in your heart to root for this guy, there's something wrong with you, people. Now, I can understand why you wouldn't hand the guy a 10-year contract yet. You want to see more of them and all that. Like X's and O's wise, the thing that ultimately matters more than anything I get, and I'm not dispelling that at all. But what I'm saying is he has got that facet covered beyond a shadow of a doubt as far as like whether or not whether or not i want this guy around for the next 10 years he has got that slam dunk no question now whether or not he can progress to that point of being a guy that could be here for the foreseeable future that's something that's going to be decided only on the football field but as far as everything else goes and a lot of what he's done so far yeah i'm pretty convinced i have i'm, I'm still at this point <clears throat> and we'll see what happens in the playoffs but for me, Jalen Hurts is the starting quarterback of the Philadelphia Eagles next year. And, and ultimately, that's what I think he was playing this year for, to just continue to climb that hill that we've talked about so many different times with him being the franchise quarterback. Not Mr. Uh, right now, but Mr. Right. And we'll talk about that with Ruben Frank. But he just continues to amaze me with uh, the maturity beyond his years. And when we talk to Ruben Frank, again, here's his article, <clears throat> 72-year-old record, excuse me, not 76 Uh, when it comes to the rushing record for the Philadelphia Eagles for most touchdowns in a season. We'll get to that with Rube, so make sure you guys uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, Jalen Hurts did address the media yesterday, uh, as did Jordan Mailata. We have a couple of cuts, uh, one from Jordan Mailata and a couple from uh, Jalen Hurts as to that letter and the mindset he has going into Saturday's game and whether or not he wants to play. Uh, And also, uh, two things that really jumped out to me from the press conferences yesterday. Jalen Hurts. Uh, as well as Jordan Mailata and what the turnaround meant to them. From going to 5-2 and two to now being 7-2 and two in their last nine games, what has this turnaround meant for them? And when did they realize the turnaround was happening? I think that's a, an important thing. Uh, and I know you can look at it and say, oh, it's when the schedule got a lot easier. But I, I think the Eagles were in danger of becoming one of those bad football teams 
that maybe the Giants were looking forward to playing, which they were once because they won one of those games, or Washington was looking forward to playing, or or Dallas continues to look forward to play. I think the thing that the Eagles had to do going into that Lions game, as I've said, was prove they're not on a Lions level, prove they're a lot better than the Lions, and they did just that. And then in games after that, prove you're not one of those teams that those other <coughs> terrible teams are looking forward to playing. Don't be that guy. Don't be that team. And the Eagles could have continued to go down that spiral. If the flower speech, if the, the, the root speech from Nick Sirianni was as bad as myself and many other people thought it was, and it all went downhill after that, if they would have then after that uh, responded as we thought they might respond, then the season could have just gone to hell in a handbag faster than any of us could have blinked. But it didn't. It turned around. So Jalen Hurts and Jordan Marlotta talked about that yesterday. But first, here is Jalen Hurts talking about the letter that he penned <laughs> regarding the guardrail situation in D.C. Um, well, it was actually sent to league officials as well. And it's, um, you know, I, I tried to handle the situation with, with a lot of poise and um, show compassion for the people that fell down, really. But I know um, it could have it could have been so much so much worse. And um, I kind of it kind of didn't hit me till after the fact, um, having some time to reflect on it and think about it. Um, so um, I just wanted to just wanted to see what what could be done to to make sure it doesn't happen again. That's all I really care about. Um, that, that's a very uh, tragic incident, and it could have been much much worse, um, much much worse. But I just don't want it to happen again. Now, the John Clark of NBC Sports Philadelphia is reporting that the Washington football team who uh, have already reached out to Jalen Hurts and they want to have a conversation with him about what happened. And I, I guess he'd be good because in the worst case, he is a uh, eyewitness to everything that happened literally right there as it happened. I mean, th 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 we've talked about many different scenarios, like what could have happened. And ultimately, what if that guardrail did fall on Jalen Hurts? What if he did get hurt? What if all of a sudden the Eagles didn't have their starting quarterback going forward? Jalen Hurts is playing this year and most likely next year for the rest of his life. Like one of the things that I, I always go back to, and I know the guy's name is Mud in Philadelphia for a lot of people, but Jason Worth, after the Eagles won uh, the World Series, uh, Jason Worth was, uh, was asked the following year, about whether or not he's going to give a hometown discount. And I, I don't fault him at all for doing this because he had been through a lot of injuries. He's been through a lot of turmoil in his career to that point. And then finally he was playing to his potential. And they said, what about a hometown discount? And he was like, <laughs> what the hell is that? A hometown discount? What are you nuts? He had said he had been playing his whole life for that season, for the season he had before he signed the big deal with the Washington Nationals. Jalen Hurts right now in football, much shorter career, as we all know. He is playing this year and most likely next year, again, as the Eagles starting quarterback for the rest of his life. He is everything, everything on the line right now to prove what he could be. Imagine if he would have got hurt in this situation. Imagine if this game next week would have really, or excuse me, this game on Saturday would have really mattered and he got placed on the COVID list like 12 other players did, and he's the one that did it. By the way, the, the first guy that puts his arm around Jalen Hurts in the video has already tweeted out that he's vaccinated, he's boosted, and all that stuff. And he tested negative on Christmas, so he recently had a test as well. So that's good. Good for you, young man. Uh, but when it comes to everything else, uh, what if you would have had a more, uh, I don't know, a, a, a physical injury more so than one that was more, uh, sickness than anything else. Th there's a lot of horrible things that could have happened here with this injury, not to mention fans themselves getting hurt. Jalen Hurts steps up and goes, yeah, what are you guys going to do about this as an organization? And it goes public. First off, we all know what a bad look that is for Washington, above all else. And second, kudos to Jalen Hurts for at least uh, going public with this. And it's not just something that's going to be pushed aside, but like, hey, what are you going to do to make sure this doesn't happen to anybody else ever again? Because a guardrail by the tunnel where players exit should kind of be secure. I always find that interesting. Like if I'm ever in an NFL stadium and I've been in a lot of them where you shake those, those, those like guardrails right by the player exits and entrances. I'm like, that's what's supposed to keep people away. Oh, okay. I guess, I guess that's how, how it works. I can only imagine at FedEx field that uh, by multiple accounts, not just my own. Now, a lot of people have come out to say 
what a dump that stadium is. Uh, Ruben Frank will also have something on that as well. Uh, as far as uh, something we hear often from Jalen Hurts, this is what he got into yesterday. He talks about w- w- our best football still ahead of us. And throughout the season, even in the 2-5 and five start, Jalen Hurts kept on banging that drum. Our best football is ahead of us. Our best, f- best football is ahead of us. We got to get rid of the self-inflicted wounds. We, have, we, have hurt, we shoot, shoot ourselves in the foot too many times. Well, Jalen Hurts was asked a question yesterday by Zach Berman of the, of the Athletic and friend of the show about what this team will look like when they're actually playing their best brand of football. And here's how Jalen Hurts talked about that. Ideally, just going out there executing man, every, 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 rep, every rep we have. Um, you know, no mental errors, no, no bust assignments, um, staying true to our fundamentals throughout the whole entire course of the game. And um, just want to go out there and, and, and play at a high level at a, at a more consistent basis. And um, one may argue or say that, hey, you've been doing that. But for me, not, enough isn't enough. So how close are you, are you guys to that level? It's coming. I, I I thought I saw that level in week one. It looked like they, they could do really no wrong after that first quarter in particular. Uh, after uh, Brandon Graham, if you remember, had a great tackle for loss to help uh, hold the, uh, the, the, the Falcons to a field goal in the early goings of that game. That was something that was really special. Uh, and from that point on, it looked like they just had that game. They dominated. Uh, the Lions game, we could all look back to and say that they just dominated that game. Uh, there's a lot of uh, different points where you saw them play their best brand of football. It was just a matter of whether or not they would play that for four quarters. Second half of the Panthers game, they played some of their best football. I think as a player, you have to realize, or as a player, your your mentality has to be that your best football is always in front of you. You're never going to play that perfect game. Nick Sirianni talked about that a couple of weeks ago. You're never going to be perfect in a game. There's always going to be something that you're going to look at and go, I could have done that better. I could have done that different. Oh, I should have looked over here if I'm a quarterback. Oh, should have made this block if I'm a lineman. That type of thing. But they have to believe that it's always in front of them. And, I mean, if they're believing that, still going into the playoffs, there's no better time to break that type of game out that you have the least concerns after a game. Maybe it's not perfect. Maybe it's not your best brand of football, but it'll definitely be where you your takeaways are not nearly as negative as they would be on the positives coming out of a game. I think that is the best brand of football that you can ask for a team, especially when they go into the playoffs, is that after the game, there's as few critiques as possible because there's going to be critiques. There's going to be things to correct. But as a player, if you're looking at that, you want as few critiques as possible to get to as close to perfection as you can. Uh, A couple of more things from Jalen Hurts yesterday that I found uh, uh, also interesting. Uh, This is just one that I think you have to hear. It is the question that we're we're asking, whether or not you want the Eagles to play their starters on Saturday. Jalen Hurts got asked that question yesterday. Hey, Jalen, uh, if you had your choice, would, would you be playing this weekend? Do you, have you given thought to whether you'd rather rest or, or play? <laughs> I love football, and I'm, I'm preparing. Um, it's, it's business as usual, so. Okay, Chris Frank. <laughs> I guess that man wants to play some football. Very simple. <clears throat> Last one from Jalen Hurts was what it takes to get to this point. He was asked yesterday by Dave Zingaro of NBC Sports Philly, about getting to this point, how you get it, get to this point as a player. What does it take? And the question was about veteran leaders on this team, guys like Greg Ward, guys like Boston Scott that aren't heavily involved in the offense, at least they weren't in the early goings of the season, Boston Scott in particular, and Greg Ward, who all of a sudden we just started seeing a goal line situation. What does it take for those guys and for the rest of this football team to rally around those guys in order to have the success that they've had right now uh, the seven and two last nine games of the season and here's how he answered that well i think it takes selflessness um, and, and as a football team we've connected so much we've connected so much we've come together so much we've grown together and we spent a lot of time with one another and i think it's shown throughout the course of the season and to have every 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 unit have every unit believing and and having that confidence in one another um, it's important and you get guys that have different roles in different situations but ultimately you got to be out of yourself and into the team and I think um, we've definitely done a good job of, of doing that this year I uh, I really 
can't believe the job. And this all goes back to the head coach. I can't believe the job Nick Sirianni has done as a head coach that has, has was not a player in the NFL. I can't get over that. Like usually if you, you look at guys like that, they have a hard time, especially in their first year, trying to get a locker room to come together. And he has had no problem whatsoever. He has spoken when he feels like he needs to speak. He says something when he feels like he has something to say. And when he hasn't, he has let his leaders speak. And he has let the chemistry of that locker room grow. And I'm not talking about roots. I'm not talking about flowers. I'm not talking about anything like that. All I'm talking about is allowing the veterans to be veteran leaders on this team. And that's something that uh, a guy like Doug Peterson, I'd expect that from because he was a player in the NFL. He understands that mentality, understands that role. He had been a coach in the NFL for a while, coordinator for a short period before taking the Eagles head coaching job. Prior to that, his only head coaching job was in high school football. But he played in the league, so he got kind of that, that learning curve. He got kind of that grace period with players because he was one. I have never seen a guy with a Mountain Union, a D3 school. I've never seen more I've never seen a guy get more out of being a D3 player amongst professional athletes more so than Nick Sirianni. And I say that as a huge compliment to Nick Sirianni and how he can read a locker room. He does a phenomenal job. And maybe that does go to the background that Nick Sirianni talks about a lot. His father's a coach. His brother's a coach. He's obviously been a coach in the NFL for a long time. He's extremely close with Frank Reich. We all know that story. Like This is amazing to me that he has done this good a job keeping this locker room together, even through the early early goings and the turmoil. And you talked about Jalen Hurts right there, listening to the veteran leaders, Nick Sirianni allowing that to happen, and everyone's chemistry in that locker room being really among the utmost respect for everybody else they have in that locker room. So that is something very, very special. Jordan Mailata, when he addressed the media yesterday, also got into that talking about when he thought that turnaround actually happened and how they hold each other accountable as players. You know, obviously making the playoffs is a big deal and especially for me, you know, starting my first year and, and playing with the, the guys on the line and, and the rest of my teammates, it's such a special feeling when you have bought into the system, the process that your head coach and your coaches are implementing. And so for us, when we look back at that two and five start, you know, we, we knew we were going to go somewhere. We knew the weapons we had on our team. Uh, we understood the process, but trusting in the process was that next step that we had to take. And once we started trusting in the process and listening to the coaches and, you know, going through the details and making sure that we weren't repeat offenders and making the same mistakes over and over again and holding each other accountable, you know, we, that's when the ball started rolling. And so that, is, that right there, uh, first off, I think we're saying uh, process wrong. I think we've been saying process wrong this whole time. We should say process. It sounds a lot fancier. Uh, but other than that, you listen to what he said right there. Once you started buying into it, I'm sure at first you're looking around and being like, first year head coach, what the hell does this guy know? And then you, then you, then you want a little bit. Okay. All right. Let's get that ball rolling. All right. I don't care who they're playing. I don't care if they're, uh, they're playing the, the bottom tier teams in the NFL, as we've talked about. I don't care if they've lost a couple of games that maybe they should have won a game like the, the chargers game, for instance, uh, where you were in that game, uh, yeah, a couple of games like that. The giants game, obviously is something you could look at as a game. They should have won. And we all know they should have won that game, but really once you start winning, that message sinks in a lot easier. And even if you have a guy like uh, Jason Kelsey breaking down the huddle, like they did in the locker room following that lions game roots on three, baby. Uh, even if they're embracing it in sort of a satiric, satirical manner, it's still helping bring those guys together. And that's something that I give full credit, full marks to Nick Sirianni for, is making sure not only he knew when to speak, but also who should speak and when they should speak. And keeping that locker room it really feeling good about themselves, despite the bad start. And making them buy in, despite being two and five, is pretty remarkable. Credit where credit's due, respect where, where respect is earned. And that's what I feel like Nick Sirianni has done. And that's Jordan Mailata talking about the whole process of it with Nick Sirianni. Uh, before we get to Rube, uh, I do want to get into the Flyers a little bit. Disappointing loss last night to the Anaheim Ducks. The Flyers dropped the puck at 10 o'clock uh, last night in Anaheim. Carter Hart was in that, made uh, 26 saves in the loss. Uh, it was an empty netter at the end, and it was a hat trick for Troy Terry for Anaheim. Got a breakaway in one of the instances. The first goal of Anaheim, I'm still not sure how it went in, but it went in 
just squeaked by Carter Hart somehow. Carter Hart was back from COVID, by the way. Uh, he, I thought he looked good last night. He made a couple of big saves. He was actually preventing the game from being about a, a 4-1 game after the first period, let alone by the end of the game. Uh, but I thought he played well last night. Uh, a couple of shots that uh, I'm sure he wishes he had back. But Terry had a breakaway for the second goal of the game uh, for Anaheim. Nothing really Carter Hart could do. Travis Sanheim got blown by. It was 2-0 in the first 10 minutes of the game and didn't have a good feeling from that point on. Ken Atkinson got a goal later in that period, so it made it 2-1. And then, really, the Flyers couldn't generate anything else. JVR had a good breakaway one-on-one with the goalie. You know, I love Seth, uh, Steph Curry. Stay with me here for a second. Uh, I love Steph Curry. But one of the things that drives me nuts is the chewing on the mouth guard. I don't, I, I don't know what it is. And last night, I'm watching James Van Riems like, and he's got a one-on-one, and he's chewing the mouth guard. And I'm like, is that – I don't know why that bothers me so much, and I know that's such a uh, – not a unique thing. I know that's such a, uh, uh, a, a pinpoint thing. That's such an obscure thing to drive me crazy. But I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Like, is that how you concentrate? I don't, I don't know. But anyway, he blew the opportunity, bottom line. Unlike Steph Curry, he hits threes. James Van Reems like, uh, didn't get this goal, unfortunately. But this is a weird thing that I noticed. Uh, so the Flyers lost last night 4-1 to one is what I'm trying to tell you. So that sucks. Uh, Sixers back in action tonight against the Orlando Magic. Looking forward to that, especially with Joel Embiid do- uh, dominating the way he's been dominating as of late. Mentioned at the top of the show, Easter Conference Player of the Month for the month of December for the way he's been attacking the basket as of late. Hopefully the Sixers, but Sixers have a chance to climb into uh, fifth place in the Easter Conference. So let's uh, let's all get really excited about that get excited when it comes to the sixers let me tell you about my good friend steven singer of steven singer jewelers the other quarter of eighth and walnut right on jewelers row in philadelphia steven's in the love business and you want to make sure you're feeling the love not only for the one you love but for steven himself when you walk into steven singer jewelers you get taken care of right out of the gate with everything uh from steven singer with the perfect price other jewelers they might mark things up wildly just to mark it down in front of you first off to try to see if they can get away with taking a little bit more of your money See if you can haggle, see if you can negotiate. So you go in there feeling like you're going to have a little pressure. Not at Steven Singer, set at the perfect price every single time. So you're not getting taken advantage of. And most importantly, you're getting the best quality diamond for that person that you love so much in your life. Whether you're looking to pop the question, whether you're looking just for the perfect gift at the perfect time for the perfect price, that's all at Steven Singer Jewelers. And if you are looking to get engaged, they got Ready for Love Diamond Engagement Rings at the ready. So it's not just a clever name. So do what I do for all your jewelry purchases. Go to Steven Singer Jewelers. Steven likes to say he's in the love business so that you feel the love when you go in. For over 40 years, he's been taking care of the great city of Philadelphia. At Steven Singer Jewelers. And you'll get walked through with everything with a real jewelry expert at Steven Singer Jewelers. One place, one price, the perfect price every single day. Steven Singer Jewelers. I hate Steven Singer.com. Always fast and free shipping at I hate Steven Singer.com. Without further ado, let's jump on the Rothman Orthopedics guest line and talk to uh, one of my. Now, I will say this Ruben alludes to this. We did, we talked for probably 20 minutes just catching up as friends before we started talking football. Uh, and that's kind of where we pick up here. So without further ado, let's start to our friend, Ruben Frank. It's right now the Rothman Orthopedics guest slide, one of my favorite people on the planet to talk to and then occasionally talk about sports with Ruben Frank of NBC Sports Philadelphia. What's up, Rube? Hey, Mark. Hey, man. Uh, I was I, just I reading something. Oh. We, just, we just sat here and talked for 20 minutes we did. about <laughs> Like that, we could have used that as a segment. We just <laughs> just BS'd about Maine and running into random people and all yeah. That stuff. So yeah, well for for the for the people, just a real quick synopsis of it. Uh, I didn't. I, I, you would go. You would go to Maine on vacation with your family. You and your daughter would go up, and you have this great time in Maine. And I'm like, who goes to like? I didn't know anybody that went to Maine except you. And then we just put it together. I just realized your dad went to college up that way. Well, he grew up in Portland, and okay, and, yeah. So we started out going to visit his mom. When I was little, we would go up twice a year visit uh, visit my dad's mom, my grandmother. So that's and I've been going ever since. Beautiful. I, I mean, I do love you know the, the the the. There's a forest up there, right? They got like trees and stuff. It's not like a city. Maine is not like a city. Maine, <laughs> Maine is ninety nine percent wilderness. Gotcha. So it's like a big Fairmount Park, like even bigger Fairmount Park. Got it. That's yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, uh, I want to show people this because uh, obviously uh, you write the ten observations. Uh, uh, every I, week. Can I give you a, 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 a Fairmount Park stat since we're doing stats here? Fairmount Park is the largest park in the world that sits entirely within one municipality. 
I did not know. I knew it was the biggest city park in, in the country. I didn't know the whole world in one year, world. municipality. One municipality. Yeah. Like it's way bigger than Central Park. Oh, yeah. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's that what, almost that's... goes into White Marsh Township, but it stops right at, at um, like George's Diner there on the <laughs> Germantown <laughs> Avenue. <laughs> You, you know that place? It's like right on the corner there. Yes. Like when you're going up into Plymouth, into Plymouth, yeah. maybe. Yes, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That's one, that's the line. Of, that's the yeah. line of demarcation. I think if you look it up on Wikipedia, it goes until George's Diner. Um, uh, but I do want to show people this one more time because you do write the ten observations on weekly th- a weekly basis. Does a great job as as per usual and all the things you write. But this is always a hot button issue for a lot of people. People are always clicking on this because it's just information in your face regarding your Philadelphia Eagles. There were two in particular that I wanted to go over with you before we get into the meat and potatoes of the Eagles. But one thing that really jumped out was that record, uh, rushing record for touchdowns in a season. I never thought we would see this in the modern era of football, but yet here we are. They're one touchdown away from scoring their uh, their most rushing touchdowns in a single season. Yeah, especially the way the season started off where – uh, it actually ran the ball a lot in the Falcons game, which is interesting. They started off the season running it really well, and they they won that game uh, going away. But then just Nick just got away from it, and he he just didn't dial it up. And so to be where they are now after going through that, I mean, there was one game where I think the running backs had three carries. There was a game where Miles had one carry. Um, so to be here sitting at 24 rushing touchdowns, uh, which is one, like you said, one shy of the record. The record is 25, set in 1941 in 10 games and tied in 1945 in 12 games. So um, it's a record that goes back a long time. And it's that's not the way most teams play football. But, you know, they've got some backs, mainly, you know, J- Jalen and Boston Scott. Boston Scott's got seven touchdowns, and he's not even like a regular – he didn't even play the first half of the season. He's just got such a nose for the end zone. So – uh, it, it's a, I, I think the word is anachronistic way of playing football, but it's working for this team with this O line and these backs and, and Jalen it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a very productive and efficient way to move the ball and score. Why do you think in the middle portions there before they made the change, why do you think Nick Sirianni got away from the run? You know, I think he's, he's a guy that loves to throw the football and he, he loves he loves the passing offense and, you know, he's been around, you think about the quarterbacks, he's been around Andrew Luck and Phillip Rivers. Uh, they're just their pocket, chuck it 50 times a game type passers. So I think he, I think he kind of, it just took him a while to, to break out of that mold that he had been in his whole career. He had never really been with a, a you know, running quarterback and a running team. So I think he just had to, now it took a few weeks, it probably took a few weeks longer than it should have, but uh, you know, the whole city was like rioting over running the ball. And, you know, look, if you have, you know, if you have Philip Rivers, it makes sense to to play football that way. You're going to win a lot of games. But you have a young quarterback who's just finding his way his first year as a starter uh, and kind of maybe inconsistent wide receivers. Uh, it, it didn't make sense. And he was putting Jalen in a very difficult position. And I think it just kind of clicked. You know, I think it clicked in the start of that Vegas game, those first two drives when Miles had, you know, he got hurt on the second drive. But those first two drives, he ran the ball great. The O-line was into it. Um, they ended up running for 130, 140 yards in that game, even without, without you know, uh, Jordan Howard was still on the practice squad. So without Miles and Jordan, and I think that day it just clicked in his mind. I could score points this way. I can move the ball this way. The O-line loves it, and it's taking pressure off my 23-year-old quarterback, light bulb. <laughs> so they've been doing it ever since, and here they are, 9-7. and seven. Is that adjustment the most impressive thing Nick Sirianni has done this season to you? Or if not, what is it? No, I think, I think the most impressive thing to me is – is keeping this team dialed in and buying in at two and five coming out of Vegas. Um, they were, they were one of the worst teams in the league. You know, I think, I think there were four teams that had a worse record after seven weeks. And that's when he gave that speech about, you know, the, the growth <laughs> under underground, which was, it really was a great metaphor for a team that, and it really pissed me off how many people mocked him and made fun of him for that. Um, and, you know, he did say – he said plant, not flower. So you know, right. you keep that in mind. Like he could have met an oak tree. <laughs> well, the, the metaphor works because 
you know, he, he was he was making this point that, you know, on the outside, you can't see the growth, but I see it. It's there. Just keep doing what you're doing and it's going to pay off. And it has. And they're seven and two since he made that speech. And, you know, I talked to a bunch of players the next day, uh, you know, and we don't get to pick who we talk to anymore. Like we're not in the locker room. So they bring players out to a tent. Now we're doing it virtually. Mm-hmm. But up until last week, we were talking to these. And I asked every player who came out about that speech and what it meant to them. And they all said, you know, it really resonated because he has such a different way. Like a lot of guys are you're used to hearing coaches speak the same way, use the same cliches and the same, you know, just got to work hard or whatever it is. Um, they said Nick's, Nick's way of of expressing what he's thinking is so different and unique that it really resonates. And, and it really kind of makes an impression on guys and, and they remember it and they live by it. And um, to me, to me, taking that team and keeping them positive and believing in themselves and believing in him um, at their lowest point, sitting there two and five, they'd lost, they'd lost what five or six, two and five. They were one and one. So they'd lost four or five games um, all by double digits, or they were trailing by double digits. At mm-hmm. one point. They were getting blown out every week, and he kept it together. And um, so when they started winning, it was like they didn't change anything. They just kind of kept staying with that process, and it's been really cool to watch. To me, that's the most impressive thing. Kind of reminded me of Doug, his first year in 16. You know, that team went through a lot with – you know, I mean, I think about that Cincinnati game. They just got, they were getting blown out. Yeah. Um, it's, a couple guys were arrested. Um, There's just a lot going on and uh, a lot of adversity. And Doug did a, just a beautiful job, you know, keeping it on the rails and keeping the guys, you know, bought in and obviously paid off the next year. They didn't go to the playoffs that year, but they, they believed in him and you could tell it was going in the right direction. So um, that's been the most impressive thing to me. Okay. Uh, now, when it comes to the quarterback, Jalen Hurts, one of the other things I wanted to highlight from your 10 observations article was his jump in completion percentage. He's only the third quarterback, according to uh, Rube's 10 observations uh, on NBC Sports Philly and the My Team's at. He's one of only three quarterbacks to take a jump of, was it 52% to over 60% in his first to second year? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think people drew, drew some conclusions about Jalen Hurts after his rookie year without keep it in mind that he can improve. Like he's allowed to get better. Quarterbacks get better. Everybody does, you know, and he had a chance to do it. And he did. I mean, to go from 52% to just under 62%. Yeah. The only quarterbacks who've ever done that are Steve DeBerg with the Niners in the late seventies. And our, our old friend, Vince Young with the Titans, Mr. Dream team himself did it. Oh, six and oh seven. I think it was. Um, and he's really improved. If you like, if you made a list at the end of last year of all the things he needed to improve on, he's improved on every one of them. Like he's, he's, he's more careful with the ball. Uh, you know, he's, he's been more accurate. I think he's seen the field better. I think he's running smarter. Uh, I think his pocket awareness has gotten better. Um, he's worked on every single aspect that needed improving and got a pretty good quarterback. People definitely need to check that out. Uh, Rube's 10 observations, a whole bunch of stuff uh, surrounding the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, Stay on Jalen Hurts for a second here. Is he the quarterback of the future? Is he the quarterback next year? To ask you this question that everyone's getting asked, everyone's talking about, who is Jalen Hurts to you right now, Ruben Frank? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, look, they're in the playoffs. I don't know how you, you know, I don't know how you make a change now. And, you know, you look at the options out there and it's like, where are you going to find somebody who's going to come in next year and be better than he is now or how better than he he will be? You know, you really want to trade for a, a veteran. Like, I mean, the Eagles are better than the Seahawks. They're with the Seahawks, five, 10 and one. Uh, yeah, I believe that's what they are right now. Yeah. And Russell Wilson is what, 33. You really want to pay all that money, give up draft picks to have an aging and I like Russell Wilson. He's a mm-hmm. Hall of Famer and he's he's still pretty good, but it doesn't make sense. The the best course of action is to surround take those draft picks and surround Jalen with as much talent as you can. I mean he's really got one reliable wide receiver. You know, I mean Quez has been okay at times and they don't really target him as much as they could. Um he's had Miles has been in and out of the lineup. Um you know so I, I think when you look at what he's got to work with and the improvement he's made uh, he's cost controlled for another two years, which is important when you want to, you know, you want to build around a young quarterback. Um, they're not going to draft a quarterback. It, it doesn't make sense. And mm-hmm. 
uh, it doesn't make sense to trade for one. So I think that the logical thing is to, you know, you're not committing to having him for the next 10 years, but you bring him back next year, you surround him with better talent. Uh, you know, you, you expect him to improve on the things he needs to improve on, which he's shown he'll do. He works so hard. You know, that's not going to be a problem. And, you know, if, if they're a playoff team with him now, you get get to upgrade the defense, upgrade the, the receiver position. Um, you know, hopefully you don't, we're not going through all this COVID stuff at this time next year. And I think you have a chance to be a pretty special team. Uh, speaking of improving, uh, to go off the quarterback sit, uh, subject for a second here, Jordan Mailata, when you talk about a rugby player. I love to... segues, by the way. Like, yeah, are they perfect? Your segues, man. They kick <laughs> ass. So I just want to, I just want to, you know. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Uh, thank you. The, uh, the, the Jordan Mailata, that fella, that guy, he loves Portland, Maine, by the way, in case you didn't know that. Uh, his improvement from rugby player to now left tackle, people gave him Pro Bowl consideration. They, they really like him, obviously. Jordan Mailata's jump to what he is right now. How impressive is that? It's incredible. It's one of the one of the more amazing things I've ever seen. And, you know, you think, I mean, he's been here four years. You know, he got here. I'll never forget his first rep. I watched his first rep of his first OTA in spring of 2018. And, like, he didn't even know how to, like, get into a stance. He didn't know how to put his pads on. Stalin's just, like, guys are laughing at him. He never played football. He never played football on any level. To to go from that, that to what he is now, it's one of the craziest things I've ever seen. And I, I, I Howie Roseman deserves a ton of credit for drafting him in the seventh round. Um you know, it doesn't matter where you get a guy. Like, they dra- that was the same, you know, like, say you got Dillard in the seventh round and Mulata in the first round. Well, those are well, those are two good picks. So you flip-flop them, and you can't rip him, you know, for drafting Dillard without giving him credit for drafting Mulata. So you, it's got to work both ways. Um, but I think he deserves a lot of credit. Stoutland des- deserves a ton of credit. But Jordan does for just coming so far. We thought it was – we didn't think he had a chance to ever play. Like he had back problems his first couple of years. He ended up on IR both years, mm-hmm. never played. I mean, he was just, you know, he was a guy we would see in the locker room and we felt bad for him. It's like, I mean, he's never going to play football. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really one of the more remarkable things I've ever seen. And he's so good. Um, it's a, you know, it's a crime that he and, and Lane weren't even, you know, what uh, uh, alternates for the pro Bowl. I mean, this, this this team's been so blessed with left tackles. You know, you, you go from Trey Thomas to Jason Peters, and now you have Malata. I mean, what is he? He's still 23. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's because he didn't play college football. He was young when he got here. Um, got a left tackle for, for the next decade. Not bad. Um, now you've built up my transition so much. I have no idea my segues. I don't even know how to ask you the next question. Uh, so I guess I'll just ask you this. Uh, are the starters going to play on Saturday? I can't imagine why. There's no reason because, you know, you could face, you'll face the same team. Like if you're the sixth seed, you play Tampa. If, if they're the sixth seed, that's the only team they can play. If they're the seventh seed, you can play the Rams, the Cards, the Cowboys, or, or Tampa. So there's no benefit in being the sixth seed. You know, there's no benefit. Usually there's a benefit in moving up. You're playing a worse team. But I think Dallas – you know, D- Dallas, Tampa, and um, LA and the Rams are, I mean, they're in a class of their own. So you want to play Arizona. You want to have a chance to play Arizona. I think they're the kind of the weakest team of the four teams they have a chance to play. So there's no reason to win the game unless you just want to say we're 10 and seven, which there's really no reason to do. It'll be a nice thing. But um, the one thing is there's only so many guys who could be active. And depending on how many of the COVID guys they get back by Saturday, some of the some of the starters will have to play just because you need 22 guys out there. So um, I think some of them, I think, that you know, the older veteran guys, you know, like and Kelsey's an interesting one because he started, he's got that streak going. He hasn't missed a game since 2014. Mm-hmm. I know he'd like to at least play the first series, uh, but Jalen Hurts, no way. You know, Fletcher Cox, Lane Johnson, no way. Um, you know, a guy like TJ Edwards, maybe, you know, you play him a couple series, maybe some of the younger guys, but I think it's going to look like a preseason game out there. Um, and, and for, for both sides, I don't know what Dallas is going to do. They can do whatever they want. I don't care. <laughs> Dallas. Um, I know he said he's going to approach it like a regular game, but I can't imagine he will. It just doesn't make sense. You know, mm-hmm. I think, but you know, you think about it, like teams play all year to get a bye week before the playoffs, right? You want to be, well, until this year it was a top two seed. Now it's a top one seed, which I hate, but, 
if you have a chance to get a bye week, even though you didn't earn one, why not take it? Like, right. you, you know, you play the whole year to try to get a bye week. So here it is. It just fell in your lap. Take advantage of it. Right. Uh, last thing for you, and it's back on the quarterback, Jalen Hurts, is about another division rival, writing the letter to the Washington football team and NFL officials about the guardrail collapsing right in front of him with fans falling at his feet. What did you make of the franchise right now, the quarterback of the Eagles, uh, writing that letter? Good for him. I mean, he's, he's 23, you know. I mean, he's he's such a – I don't know. He's He's just got so much – perspective on life and he's such a wise a wise young guy and um it's it's all really genuine i mean like he was he's really concerned about people falling out of there and he should be i mean that well you've been to that stadium i mean that is that's a hellhole you know i ranked i ranked all 55 nfl stadiums that i've ever covered a game in i think it was two years ago i did that and astrodome was last you probably never covered no I only walked outside the Astrodome because the Texans play right next to it now. Yeah, Energy Stadium. That's where Villanova won a national title, by the way. That's right. That's right. Well, yeah, I know. I was there. You were there. (laughs) (laughs) But the Astrodome is the worst stadium I've ever been in. Okay. FedEx was 54th. So it was FedEx. Like, FedEx is worse than the vet. And, like, I I don't glorify the vet at all. I hated the vet. But FedEx is worse. You know, they they used prefab like concrete they they built it like they're trying to build it before jack kent cook died he wanted to see it built which he ended up not not doing but they they rushed it it's got no character it's got no uh no personality it's just like this remember the old shea stadium it's just like a it's just like this blob of concrete in the middle of a like suburban neighborhood it's an awful awful horrible place so that didn't surprise me that it happened. They don't maintain it. It's falling to pieces. They already need a new stadium. It's, it's really the same age as the link, which is incredible. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, anyway, to get back on your question, I, I give Jalen a lot of credit because, you know, coming from him, you know, it's going to be people are going to keep up on Washington getting that thing fixed and reinforcing any railings that they need to reinforce. And, you know, he, he's going to uh, he's going to make sure that gets done. So I give him a lot of credit for that. All right, this is the last one for you, I promise you. Uh, I remember I never followed up with you. The last you. one was the last yeah, one. I, I know, but and, 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 whatever I... Starting, man. Whatever I, I, you, I can't miss the pyramid, Mark. <laughs> All I want to know is who won the concert contest. You and your friend tried to go to the most concerts individually, not together, but separate. Who won that contest? You were up to like 320 in one year. Who won? It was 2017, the, uh, the road to 300. There's still litigation going on, so I'm not really... At liberty to comment. <laughs> um, yeah, all right. And, uh, uh, I saw 383 concerts. He he saw. I think he finished at 371. He wow. claims that he got to 300 faster, but he misrepresented the number of concerts he had been to <laughs> going into the last day of it. And then he texts me. We were both at different shows. Like most of them, we went to the, you know we went to a lot of shows uh, together. But he texted me. Said, "Oh, I counted wrong." I'm actually over 300 now. Whatever. All right. If it comes to numbers, I trust Ruben Frank over anybody yes, else. Right? So hopefully, you know, the litigation, I mean, we're taking it all the way to Supreme Court, baby. This is- <laughs> Let me know. All right. I know uh, the, the 10,000 pyramid is uh, starting soon. Good luck watching that. I know you know all the answers already. From NBC Sports Philadelphia, make sure you guys check him out right here for Rube's 10, 10 observations, as well as give him a follow on Twitter if you don't already. You got 121,000, my friend. Wow. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. And that's Ruben like Frank. Block like three hundred thousand. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rube, always great catching up, my friend. Thanks so much. Check him out uh, from NBC Sports Philadelphia. The great and the My Teams app. The great Ruben Frank. Thanks, Rube. Thanks, Mark. My thanks to Ruben Frank for joining us on the Rothman Orthopedics guest line. Three hundred and like fifty shows. I haven't been to that many concerts in my life. I maybe have been to 20 concerts in my life. And that was before the pandemic. One of my New Year's resolutions was, uh, you know, I want to go see more live music. I haven't experienced enough live music. I've seen, like, Dave Matthews a bunch of times. And that, that's it. I can't really do too many. I saw Lumineers a bunch of times. My wife really likes Lumineers. I like the Lumineers, sure. Uh, 
And then uh, I saw Ben Folds. Yeah, I w- I've probably been to 20 concerts. I saw Lady Gaga. Uh, I saw that lady do her thing. She was pretty fun. Uh, yeah, I haven't been to many concerts. And Rube would go over to like, um, what's the, uh, the the thing with the guys playing the music and the stuff? Uh, the, 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 the nooner, the, the, the music over there by Penn, I want to, I want to say they'd go over there and they'd have a little show and stuff and they'd have themselves a good time. Uh, and that would be like a, a midday concert. And then he just goes to concerts after like he goes to a press conference, goes to a concert. Like that's the guy. He, that's what he does. He's amazing. Love that guy. Uh, but yeah, uh, Ruben Frank joining us right there on the Roth Growth Peaks guest line. Uh, I see some of you guys disagree with some of the stuff he had to say. I see a lot of you guys agreeing with a lot of the things he had to say. So we'll jump to that in our chat check coming up in just a second. But right now, let me tell you how great Rothman Orthopedics is, ladies and gentlemen. When you have an orthopedic issue, you need a physician who eats, sleeps, and breathes orthopedics. You need an exceptionally specialized Rothman Orthopedics physician. They not only specialize in orthopedics, but each of their physicians only focuses in on one area of the body, which means... You can have the confidence to get past the pain and be what you were. Learn more at RothmanOrtho.com. That's RothmanOrtho.com. Rothman Orthopedics, the official orthopedic partner of your Phillies, Eagles, and 76ers. How about the people at BetQL, ladies and gentlemen? If you want to get the advantage over your sports book, download the BetQL app to your phone. Their best bets computer model scans over 350,000 unique bets per year to give you the best bet recommendation for every game across all major sports, and they give you the reasoning behind why you should place that bet. Their model covers everything from point spreads, over-unders, player prop bets as well, and if you don't want to use their model and prefer to do your own research, BetQL is all the necessary tools for your betting research needs. Everything from sharp data, line movement, team summaries, lineups, injuries, breaking news, even a leaderboard, for you to track your own success, and you'll have a lot of it if you use BetQL. Head to the App Store or Google Play Store now to download the BetQL app. All the stories going on across Philadelphia. Make sure you're following it all across PHL Sports Station, Philadelphia Sports Station, enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience across all social media and blogs. PHL Sports Nation.com. How about WinView? Have you downloaded the WinView app yet? Are you having yourselves a good time? What did I tell you? Keep on riding. Joel and Beats over for the prop of the day. Probably going to be against Orlando Magic today, around 28 and a half, maybe. Guy's averaging over 30 points a game over his last stretch here, over his last five games. That's not bad. Might want to stick with Joel Embiid here. You know who you don't want to stick with? Tobias Harris. <laughs> hey, who? hopefully it'll be the, the, the fire that he needs lit under him. Maybe Hopefully that'll be the case. But Winview is the only game where fans can take on other fans and end the debate once and for all, who's the bigger sports fan? If you have those friends and family members who think they know everything about sports, Challenge into a WinView contest and see if they can walk the walk as well as they talk the talk. If you want to break up the monotony of family dinners and get-togethers, play a quarter of Monday Night Football. Play a little Saturday football, maybe. Have yourself some fun on WinView. Maybe some NBA games. If you're tracking the games on Sunday and you want to see if your team is killing it, uh, well, maybe challenge a friend to a WinView contest and see if you're a particular player can kill it for you in a win view contest. It's not a sports book. It's not daily fantasy. It's a social gaming app where fans can take on other fans for to win real money prizes and make predictions on the games that you love so much. So download the WinView app right now. All right, now it's time for everyone's favorite part of the show, the chat check, ladies and gentlemen. Let's check in and see what all the good people of Philadelphia are saying. Good morning, Dan Schwartz. Nice to have you. Carter, good morning, Carter. J- James, what's going on, James? Uh, Dan is saying that they zip-tied the rail, so they're good right now in in Washington. What else would they do? Uh, Good on him. It's a great move on his part. April right there talking about uh, the letter, and here's the letter one more time from Jalen Hurts. Uh, I am writing to inquire about what the follow-up action is being considered in response to the near-tragic incident that took place at FedEx Field. Yeah, it could have been tragic if somebody got hurt. Fortunately, everyone's good. Fortunately, everyone's good. Could have been tragic for Jalen Hurts. As I said, the, 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 he gets an injury, misses out on an opportunity to play in the playoffs. A guy trying to prove himself. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's tough. Uh, that'd be tragic. Uh, not on the scale of other actual humane tragedies, but for tragic career-wise, certainly. Uh, the zip tied the rail. That's good. Uh, I bet Dan Snyder likes weather girls. Luigi. Uh, PJ and I were just talking about that. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, how messed up, how really messed up. Did you guys read that Washington Post article from about two years ago about what the Washington football team was doing? Allegedly. I mean, the sexual harassment stuff, awful in the workplace. That happens a lot, and that's terrible. Uh, but even worse than that, it, uh, you know what I'll put up uh, worse than that? Whoring. 
And that's what Washington was supposedly doing with their cheerleaders. Oh, yeah, why don't you go, uh, you know, you give me your passport so you can't do anything. Uh, and then, you know, you got to take these clients out. Like, escort service style. That ain't right. And that's what they're being accused of. So, Dan Snyder, how the hell do you still own a football team? What? And this guy's going to be naming and announcing a new team name in a couple weeks? What? Bizarro world, folks. Uh, John, good morning, John. Rick, nice to have you. <laughs> Dan, ice skating my way to work today. Uh, yeah, it's supposed to be freezing out there. Temperatures freezing overnight. Cecily Tynan said that, the nice lady on the news. She said that, so be careful uh, out there. Uh, Luigi, I apologize. I have seen your comments uh, where you haven't watched the show live, but you are looking for a weather girl. My apologies. We will get one uh, in the near future. No, next storm of the century. I guarantee you we'll have a nice weather lady on. Uh, John Cheeseborough, if uh, Hertz had Vic's arm, he'd be exactly what the Eagles needed for the next decade. Look, I th yes, thousand percent, absolutely. I don't know too many people that have had Vic's arm. I mean, I, I've seen guys that can just sling. I mean, we've all seen guys that can sling it. I mean, Aaron Rodgers, uh, obviously, Patrick Mahomes, you know, those guys. But it's something about the way Michael Vick, Michael Vick threw a football that it was every motion from Michael Vick was, well, he's lefty. So it was like that. That was it. That was just this. It was back, and the elbow was far ahead of the hand. You know, great torque he would get. It looked like it, it was a cannon. Like the only other person that I can compare it to where the, where the ball was here and then gone. Like Brett Favre was like a whole body throw. Like when he geared up the throw, man, it was incredible. The only other guy that could just kind of flick a wrist that I remember, like Randall Cunningham. And Randall could, you know, really get down and almost like scrape the ground with the football and then throw it. But also on a, he would just get that quick release too and just ball was gone. That's the only two that I can look at. Michael Vick and Randall Cunningham were the only two guys that I really remember just all oh, looked like, nah. And the ball was 70 yards down the field. But yeah, I would love for for uh, for Jalen Hurts to get that. Absolutely. Uh, but how about those numbers from Rube? We talked about the, the rushing record early. But then again, to only be at, what was it, 53%? Uh, let's see. Uh, third quarterback in history to complete 52% or worse in his rookie season of his passes, uh, then over 60% in his second year. Only three quarterbacks have done that. That's insane. Um, Luigi, I want to go to a concert with Rube and just enjoy natural herbs. I know what you're talking about. Uh, Dan says, definitely wasn't tragic. Dangerous, but not tragic. Uh, Career-wise, could have been, but you're right. Near tragic uh, for, for him, for uh, Hertz, certainly. Uh, but yeah, in the grand scheme of tragedies that we've dealt a lot with over the last couple of years here in particular, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, good morning, Fuji. What's going on, man? Nice to have you. Go birds. Dan Smider must have <laughs> compromising picks of Roger Goodell. <laughs> Do you I think it was GQ that wrote the story on Roger Goodell, which is odd, but it was GQ about Roger Goodell before he was the commissioner. He worked in a bar. And at this one bar, there was a glass wall. And apparently Roger Goodell enjoyed pranking friends by shoving his ass cheeks on that wall and making them look at his butt. And that's what I think of when I think of this guy trying to be a buttoned up commissioner of the NFL. Uh, I want to go to a concert with Ruben during natural herbs. Luigi, who doesn't? You know what I'm saying? James, what's going on? Dan, I'm going to go stand in the corner now, JC. Why, why are you being put in the corner? Craig, good morning. Uh, da, 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 da. Wait a minute. Dan, you literally made the music video episode of In Living Color go through my head? What? Oh, my God. Yo, VIP, let's kick it. Ice, ice, baby. Ice, ice, baby. All right, stop, collaborate, and listen. Ice is back with a brand new invention? All right. I don't need context. Uh, <laughs> you guys are off the rails as usual. Uh, my favorite thing in the morning is to boycott weather girls. Mm. Uh, that's Luigi. <laughs> Luigi is deadly. What the hell is happening here? 
Where I like this random. Where the hell is Mally? Oh, April says I did hear back from Mally. He's good. He'll be back. Adulting break. Nah, I hate adulting. Uh, so calm, calming. Rube is calming. Uh, so is uh, Jalen Hurts uh, apparently. Uh, Snyder brought in MacGyver to fix that railing. They gave him uh, a pencil eraser, eraser, and a stick of gum and a rubber band. John, uh, that was a great show. MacGyver was a great show. Richard Gene Anderson, man. My lot of speaks funny, says uh, Luigi. I get what you're saying there. Uh, very calm. Before anyone lashes out. What? I'm kidding. Calming down before anyone lashes out. We have, uh, apparently on the Farsi show, we have a very big Aussie contingent. And we are proud of that Aussie contingent. We love that Aussie contingent. So I can only imagine, Luigi, if somebody sees you saying that he talks funny, oh, yeah, they're coming at you. The Aborigines, right? That's Australia? Yeah. Uh, they're they're going to come and get you. Uh, let's see here. That's uh, what an Australian it sounds like. A... <laughs> uh, Luigi, you're all about the weather girl today, man. It's going to be cold outside. That's, that's what I got for you. Mally! Mally is here! What's up, Mally? Good morning, my good people. Just want to say this. Mental health is no joke. It has been a weird and crazy week and a half. Starting to feel like myself again. Oh, Mally. Saying it so, brother. Good to have you back either way, man. Hope you're all right. I mean that uh, in, all in all sincerity, my friend. Uh, hopefully, Mally. Is, let's say everyone said Mally. Oh, you're already doing it. Of course you are, because you guys are awesome in the chat. Sending Mally your love. April, Dan, all you guys. That's great. Uh, if I could, would you? Sending love. That's great. Um, That's great. This is all nice. Oh, you guys are great. Uh, Mal, you deserve every bit of this, man. Seriously. Oh, this is beautiful. Uh, Ronald's checking in. Hey, Mally, I know we don't know each other personally. I only know you through the chat, and I hope you're doing okay. You're a huge piece of this show since day one. Absolutely true, Ronald. Absolutely true. Um, Kevin saying good morning to everyone. If everyone gets an extra zoo bobblehead, hook a girl up. If anyone gets an extra zoo bobblehead, hook a girl up. Uh, my man, Ruben Frank, if I could, would you? Zoo bobbleheads are awesome. Zoo, uh, Benny, what's up, Benny? Good morning, Benny. Nice to have you. <laughs> I want to participate and shadow everything. The blunts, the naps, the stats. <laughs> We can all have goals, Benny. That's the, that's the, we all have goals. Henry, the chat is always as uh, entertaining. Sushi, Trent, what's going on? Henry says, I could have sworn he said flower. I'll go back and check the transcript. But I remember the next day thinking, oh, he didn't say flower? Huh. Uh, who would pay for an NBC Sports Philadelphia hoodie? That's like paying for a SEPTA jacket. Hey, both are fine products. I will say that. Uh, a couple of guys arrested. That was real casual. That's funny. Uh, oh, that's very nice, Nate. Thank you, Mark. Love your interviews. You let the guests speak. It's a lost art. I will say that's one of the things I, I enjoy a lot more in this type of format than like sports talk radio. It's like you got to drive an ego a lot of the times in sports talk radio. And when you do a podcast or web show, it's such a uh more unique audience in that they already know you they already kind of i not i don't want well, to toot my horn but like it's like obviously you guys like me somewhat if you're watching so it's like it's a much more intimate setting like i don't feel like i don't feel like i need to especially if i just go through the first 15 20 minutes of the show telling you what i think bring in the other perspective pick their brain a little bit that is the floor is theirs. That's why you have a guest to get that different perspective or to confirm how you feel already or tell you you're just a big fat idiot. And one of the things I like about Rube is he'll be like, uh, well, Mark, you're an idiot. You're a big fat idiot. And I'm like, oh, thanks buddy. Like uh, Rube, all honesty, Rube was invited to my wedding. Like that's how much I love that guy. Um, <clears throat> and I think that uh, he obviously provides great sports content. And then he also provides it in an entertaining fashion. Uh, can absolutely rip power. For, no, I do. I, that's where I will disagree with uh, Rube. And Jacob, you're right. If you're going to praise him for my lot, you can't rip him for uh, Dillard. I don't agree with that at all. Because in the first round, it's essentially like a, a first round pick is a $100 bill. And you don't walk into a store looking to spend a $100 bill. If you're going to take that $100 bill into a store and buy something, you want to make sure you get exactly what that $100 bill is worth. You know, you want to get your money's worth, right? That's what a first-round pick is. Dillard ain't that. 
Milata was bargain shopping, and you ended up finding a beautiful, beautiful uh, armoire for your apartment, your house, whatever it might be. Like it, it's the, the 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 stock and the value is a lot different, which is why you can say, well, why did you spend a first round pick on that when he's not that? Why did you spend all that money on somebody that's not worth it? Why did you you spend a first round pick on that as opposed to taking a flyer on a guy late in the draft? So yes, you can absolutely be uh be upset with how he. Uh, I bet Farzi knows Rube not from NBC, but from what? <laughs> Don't bring Rube into my that those circles. Uh. Let's see the pregame show. <laughs> they pregamed this show at Checkers. If I could, would you? Yeah, I would do it. Absolutely. Fighter, what's up, Tom? I was running an idea by my friend Tom, who's in the chat right now. What's up, bud? Uh, I I really want to do a Nick Sirianni story. I really want to do a Nick Sirianni movie. They just made the Kurt Warner movie. I want to do a I want to do a Nick Sirianni story. I don't know what I'd call it yet. I think I would call it. Growing Roots, the Nick Sirianni story, working title, or Roots, Paper, Scissors, the Nick Sirianni story, one man's love of ball, like something like that, and do a full full feature-length trailer on it, on this movie. I would play the role of Nick Sirianni, of course. Uh, And for those people that still are joining the show uh, and they watch later, and they tell me, hey, do you you know you look like Nick Sirianni? Yes. (laughs) To answer that question, I know I look like a fatter, balder Nick Sirianni. We're around the same age. He's got like a year on me, though. Uh, But, uh, yes, I'm aware that we have a resemblance. Um, I don't see it out of the gate, but enough people have told me where now I'm like, oh, no, I kind of see it. If he had a fatter, uh, bald brother, I could be that guy. I could be that guy. Uh, I I would be like the outcast in the family that was never a coach. And I only played one year of freshman football and I sucked. And then everyone in the family was like, you know, maybe you should go into art. You know, maybe you should, you know, something like that. Um, the engine is running. What? Uh, he's actually, Jacob, he's actually at 552 concerts. That's funny. Dave Matthews Bland. Wow. If I could, would you? <laughs> April, Mark, the bands you're listening to are not, not helping your stoner image. I think she means me sh- uh, shedding that stoner image. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware. I'm aware. Danelle Pumphrey. Wow. Don Vito. Holy snap. Farzi, you're looking thin, my man. Thank you, buddy. That's very, you know, I got on the scale the other day. I don't want to brag. And I thought with the holidays and stuff, I'd be really up there. I was not. I was one of my skinnier versions of myself somehow magically. Uh, so, now I'm going to eat whatever I want and gain what I thought I originally gained. And that's, that has been the case. Uh, Farzi does have a Sirianni beard. Yeah. Uh, wait, Farzi show you guys, the whistleblower for what beard wise Farzi looks like Sirianni. Okay. Uh, <laughs> roots, paper, scissors, 100% trademark at Farzi says, buddy, uh, Kirk Coleman's still in the NFL. Kirk Coleman's awesome. I got to know him when he was in Philly pretty well. Really good dude. You get diamonds in the rough in a late round by luck. Don Vito? That's not a bad phrase. Uh... (laughs) Blunts, naps, and stats. Classic Benny. You guys are off the charts as per usual. Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate everyone. Wait, not enough seven fishes on seven fishes? Tom Finer. I got after it, the seven fish. I made a nice uh, lobster ravioli. Ooh, wow. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, thanks, everyone, for participating in the chat. You guys are awesome, as per usual. And uh, let me just end the chat with, with this. Mally, you're the man. Uh, you know how much uh, you mean a lot to me, buddy. You, you supported me throughout my entire career. You really have. And for you to be a part of this show, like everyone in the chat, uh, you're one of the OGs, obviously, Mally. I hope you're doing well, buddy. I hope you had a, I hope your holidays were better than what's being implied. And I hope you are. Back to feeling 100% as soon as humanly possible, Mally. Seriously, I appreciate everything you've done for the show, man. You're the man. Appreciate you. Um, thanks for everyone that participated in the chat. You guys are fantastic. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, let's jump in now to our morning rush brought to you by Sky Motor Cars, skymotorcars.com. Uh, wanted to make sure I got this in here. 
Sixers, we're still waiting on news for the Sixers uh, for Matisse Thibel as well as Tyrese Maxey as whether or not they'll be available for tonight's game. Both went into uh, COVID protocols, health and safety protocols for the NBA. We'll see how that develops. Uh, right now, Joel Embiid still very much, still very much um, on track uh, to keep on hitting his over many times over. So we'll see how that plays out tonight against the Orlando Magic. Uh, Sixers are going to be in Orlando for that game. And we'll also continue to follow the story on the Eagles and whether or not they're actually going to have their starters play on Saturday. Uh, tomorrow, we hope to be joined by Mike K of NJ.com to break down the Eagles further and talk about uh, Jalen Hurts, as well as this turnaround, defensively speaking, by Jonathan Gannon's unit. We'll focus a little bit more on the defensive side of things tomorrow when it comes to the Philadelphia Eagles. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, much appreciation. Mally, I see you. Again, you're the man, brother. Thanks very much. Uh, have a great rest of your day, everybody. Uh, Jim Hyden produced the program. Did a phenomenal job, as per usual. This is a Buzz Sports Entertainment production. I'm Mark Farzetta from the Steven Singer Studios. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Talk to you tomorrow.